Transmissions from Hawaii. Producer Tony Vega here, and today we're starting things off in a parking lot at the University of Hawaii at Mano. Hello, uh, Dr. Morioka. This is Antonio Vega. Um, I'm great. Yes, so I'm in, I think it's Zone 13. I'm in the parking lot. So, yes, Antonio is my actual full first name, but that is besides the point. The Dr. Morioka that you just heard me talking to on the phone is Dr. Brennan Morioka, the Dean of the College of Engineering at the University of Hawaii. And I went to the university to talk to him about something that you've probably never heard of. And yet, it's absolutely integral to the way that we live our lives today. In fact, I don't think I would have been able to make the phone call that you just heard me make without it. What I'm talking about is called AlohaNet, and it was developed at the University of Hawaii's College of Engineering in the late 60s and early 70s. It really was the birth of the way we live our modern lives. I mean, mm. you know, yes, we rely on the internet, but even more so today, everything is mobile. Mm. So everything from any kind of wireless communications, whether it's your cell phone, Wi-Fi, everything has its roots based back in AlohaNet. Developed by a team led by Dr. Norman Abramson and Franklin Kuhl, AlohaNet was created with the intention of using it to send data between islands here in Hawaii. Simply put, AlohaNet was a success, and it ended up being the first system ever to transmit data between computers using radio waves. What it really does is it, it helps to sift through and organize data, you know, through radio packets mm -hmm. using radio waves. And, and a good example of this, and one of our faculty kind of shared this example, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, it's, it's very much for uh, people like me who mm -hmm. aren't technically savvy with communications and wireless stuff because mm -hmm. I'm a different kind of engineer. Mm -hmm. But the example is, you know, if you're sitting at a, at a dinner party mm -hmm. with a lot of people and everybody has a lot to say and they want to start talking story, uh, so everybody starts talking all at once. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, human nature is you kind of stop, slow down kind of let someone say something so everyone can listen. Mm -hmm. And then when they're done, then someone else now starts to talk. And if multiple people talk again, you slow down and you that one person talks. And then so you start organizing a conversation. And that's, that's kind of human nature, right? Mm -hmm. we, 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 we try to organize the way that we communicate. Otherwise, we're just talking over each other. Mm -hmm. Well, data used to be sent that way too. So when data got sent at the same time and it hit each other, they would just get rejected. AlohaNet protocols actually allowed it to be organized so that uh, data could be sent. Even if, it's, even, even if they're running into each other, it can be organized in a way or get scheduled so that the data will get sent. So if it gets bumped and it doesn't get sent, it knows that, and then it'll resend it again until that message is actually sent through. So the next time you make a phone call on your cell phone, make sure to say a little thank you to Dr. Norman Abramson, Franklin Cool, and the team that worked on AlohaNet, because without what they achieved, who knows where we would be? We, we'd probably still be making phone calls from landlines, I guess. Aloha protocol is still used by all cell phones. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that is communicated when you turn your cell phone on, that you send the message, is that your cell phone says to the other cell phone, Aloha. Mm -hmm. So we really are continuing to spread aloha around the world. So it kind of gets back to one of those, those songs, right? Spread a little aloha <laughs> around the world. And it's really true. I mean, that's, that's really what Norm and Frank did is they continue to spread aloha because aloha is the first thing that, that is said uh, when someone makes a phone call. On this episode of Transmissions from Hawaii, we are talking about Hawaii's relationship with the internet. So we started things off by talking about AlohaNet, which helped usher in the age of wireless digital communications. But there is so much more to talk about than just that. For example, Hawaii's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Have you ever stopped to think about how it is that Hawaii is connected to the internet? Well, that's a really interesting topic, and we're going to be talking about that, plus a whole lot more. So let's get started. For the past couple of decades, getting access to the internet from your home hasn't been a challenge pretty much at all. You just call up your internet service provider and pretty soon you're hooked up. But that's definitely not the case for everyone. Our first story is about a community on Oahu that didn't have direct access to the internet until November of 2019. 
So just for anybody that is is not aware what the nation of Hawaii is, could you explain like what a little bit of background information? Yeah. So the nation of Hawaii is the oldest uh, Hawaiian sovereignty group in existence today. We advocate for total independence for the Hawaiian people because of the injustice of the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom in 1893. And subsequently, when the U.S. apologized for that overthrow in 1993 and admitted to the crime, our head of state, Dennis Bumpy Kanahele, uh, helped create the nation of Hawaii with his kupuna. And uh, we've been carrying on this legacy ever since and to to the point where we have um, gotten our own land base, which is uh, the village of Pu'uhono or Waimanalo, where we uh, have created Hawaii First Community Broadband Network. That's Brandon Maka'ava'ava, the Deputy Head of State of the Nation of Hawaii. The story of the Nation of Hawaii is a long and complex one, and unfortunately we don't have time on this episode to cover it in its entirety. However, what you should know is that they're based out of a 55-acre plot of land in the Waimanalo area of Oahu. They acquired that land in 1994 after a more than year-long occupation of Makapu Beach Park. In exchange for vacating the park, they got a 55-year lease on an undeveloped parcel of land in Waimanalo, and that is where they established the village of Puhonuo o Waimanalo. About how many people live there at, at present? Um, at the Puhonuo, we have... Uh... It varies between maybe eighty to about ninety people. Um, mm-hmm. It's a it's a group of families now. Um, it's mm-hmm. a, a lot of women, children, men, um, people mm-hmm. that have uh, that were there at um, our previous occupation of Makapu Beach back in nineteen ninety three when we uh, leveraged the state with the apology bill to to get mm-hmm. our land. So. They basically just moved that occupation that was down at the beach for 15 months and moved mm-hmm. it up towards the mountains where we um, develop our own solutions for housing, uh, mm-hmm. food, clothes, shelter, water, everything. As for the internet, well, that's another area that they had to figure out for themselves. Brandon explains that for almost all of the village's history, they've had to resort to all kinds of ways in order to get online. Not surprisingly, doing things this way was not only complicated, it also wasn't all that cost-effective. A lot of the times, they ended up paying quite a bit more than what your average person pays per month. There was a point in time where we had, um, you know, pretty cheap internet. It wasn't the best, but it it was kind of cheap. But uh, most everybody's household bill for internet was was over $100 if you factor Mm -hmm. in satellite dish. um, Mm -hmm. You know, it there wasn't one dedicated place where you got your internet. There was a combination of satellite, of mobile, mm-hmm. of hotspots. And because these are families that live in these houses. So it's not just one person trying to get internet. You have, you have the kids, you have, mm-hmm. you know, you have um, other people trying to access the internet at the same time. So one solution wasn't good enough. We, we had to have multiple solutions. So multiple solutions mean multiple bills which add up to you know in the hundreds a month per household so you're figuring we have about 20 households up there that you know it was anywhere from maybe two thousand to three thousand dollars total for internet for the whole village so how was it that the nation of hawaii managed to finally fix their internet problem yeah and well in um the very beginning was uh burt lum Mm-hmm. who is the, the strategy, broadband strategy expert for the DBED Department uh, Department of Business mm-hmm. uh, Development and Tourism in Hawaii. He was, you know, he's very instrumental in starting this whole thing. Um, I believe he went to an Indigenous Connectivity Summit back in 2018 uh, that was put on by a group called the Internet Society. And so he went there and it was being held in Inuvik, which is kind of near the North Pole. And, um, you know, it just was blown away that that the Internet Society, their reach, you know, they were able to not only put on a conference, but they were able to actually do this workshop where they they helped to create a a broadband network for the indigenous community that was hosting them. Mm -hmm. And so Bert was, you know, talking with with, um, Mark Buell from the Internet Society and some of the other folks there that, you know, He'd like to host next year's conference 
So that ended up being the 2019 conference. And so Mark Buell and the Internet Society folks really wanted to do, you know, the same thing that they did for every Indigenous Connectivity Summit was find an Indigenous community that 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 is that is hosting um, the conference and find a community that they can help create a community network. So it was mainly Bert, um, you know, working with Mark, and then and then on Bert's end, he had to find a community, and so. You know, it, it, there's a lot of red tape that goes along with trying to find an indigenous community to work with. Because if you're going to work with Hawaiians, we're spread out all over the place. You know, there there isn't a community that just has Hawaiians in it where you can just go to. We're different than than other places that have federal recognition where you have, you know, a, a reservation. We don't have mm-hmm. one, right. but we have stuff like Hawaiian homes, which mm-hmm. which is also something that you know that that he tried to look at you know, to find a community through there, it was kind of, you know, it's, it's a lot of red tape there. So he reached out to one of his friends, Colin Kippen and asked if, you know, well, what about Bumpy's, you know, land? He, he get land, he get on community. You think he would be interested? Mm -hmm. And because Colin knew uh, Uncle Bumpy, um, our head of state of our nation, he, um, he's like, yeah, let me give him a call. So we set up a meeting. Uh, We talked story with Bert. You know, mm-hmm. we like the idea because we have internet issues and we like the idea that somebody's going to help us bring internet to our village. Mm-hmm. Um, Bert started the whole process and, and we brought in the Internet Society. We had a good meeting and then we went forward in a partnership between us, the Nation of Hawaii, mm-hmm. Bert, the State of Hawaii, Mark Buell from the Internet Society, and then we looped in Hawaii Intel to deliver the backhaul to us, which, which was mm-hmm. a huge portion because, um, you know, without the backhaul, without the fiber getting to us there, there, you know, there's big costs in it. And, and so mm-hmm. we needed the help of Hawaiian tail to be involved. And finally Hawaiian tail, you know, I think it was just a matter of time till they got involved with us, but mm-hmm. we brought the right people to the table. Um, Bert was a big help because he's, he's with the state kind of mm-hmm. gave us some legitimacy. And then you see something like the internet society, hosting their, you know, global conference here in Hawaii, you know, Hawaii Intel wanted to be part of it. So, it, you know, it was an incentive that everybody made out in the end. Mm. So in terms of like from the uh, like construction kind of perspective, what what was that Hawaiian Telecom that they, they helped? Like, I guess you need like some kind of hub. And then from there you run cable to each like house. Is that how it works? How, did, how does that go? So, so what happened was, um, you know, the, um, when, when Uncle met with Bert and Uncle mm-hmm. met with Toy and Tell and Internet Society, we needed to kind of educate them on, on what our lands actually is and mm-hmm. how we do things on our lands where, you know, we, we are the ones responsible for putting in anything. You know, not, mm-hmm. we don't rely on the state. We don't rely on anybody else. So mm-hmm. it had to be like a, like a partnership. So what happened was um, Hawaiian Tell agreed to, to run the fiber to one of our telephone poles on the outside of our property near the road. Oh. And then we agreed on our end that we would trench the rest mm-hmm. in. And so wow. they, they provided the fiber, um, the conduit that, 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 that it went in. And we provided the manpower and the machines to actually dig the trench and actually trench um, the conduit up to our um, central hub where we had it maybe about 600 feet um, uphill away from the road. So we had to trench about 600 feet to to our central um, meeting area, which was our, our, our pavilion where we housed, uh, you know, everything, the fiber, where it came in, the, the you know, the routers and all the equipment that, that would run the, the the internet service. And so from that hub, what what happens is it, it it's almost like a radio tower, mm-hmm. but um it's it's a high you know something that's built for the internet so it's it's it can carry like fiber optic type speeds over mm-hmm. it and, and it can broadcast it directly to a house. So mm-hmm. what happened was when we set up that that hub, mm-hmm. we knew that you know from from that central hub we would have mm-hmm. to place. Uh, what they call CPE units, which is mm-hmm. basically an antenna on each house mm-hmm. to actually receive the signal from the central hub. And we could, mm-hmm. you know, manage it that way. So once it came in physically, mm-hmm. we dug the trench and put everything in physically. Everything else is wireless. 
Mm, and so yeah. it's wireless from the central hub out to the different houses because we're not all like, you know, it's not flat ground. It's not all on the same street. Oh, we're on a hill gotcha. and there's trees in between and there's, you know, all kinds of stuff, yeah. geographical things that we had to like kind of maneuver around. And we're still working on that today. We still have issues because of, you know, somebody's the positioning of people's CPEs and antennas and stuff. So mm-hmm. that's something that we're slowly kind of working out. Wow. So from the point where Hawaiian Telecom did their thing, they connected uh, to the telephone pole on the outside of the property to the point where people were getting access at, at their house. Like about how long was that process? To lay the fiber, that was, that was uh, uh, we did that in one day with, oh. with Hawaiian Tel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we did that in one day because, mm-hmm. you know, our, our people, we experience with doing our own utilities. We, we, mm-hmm. we run our own water lines. We do our own electric. So whether they wanted to go up on the poles or, or in the ground, mm-hmm. our people are prepared for that. Wow. Um, it's just a matter of resources sure. to help us so that, you know, things, things were taken care of by, by the Internet Society. So we didn't have to put in any additional costs. Mm-hmm. So we, we donated our time and, you know, we put our people's time into doing that so you know that was our contribution to the project and Mm -hmm. so um doing the indigenous connectivity summit piece Mm -hmm. of that where the internet society came and had the conference in in hilo uh for two days and then two days had the conference continued the conference at our village where we actually built the system together with Mm -hmm. experts from Mm -hmm. the internet society Mm -hmm. that took two days so Mm -hmm. total of maybe three days Wow. So in terms of like a practical cost, like I I guess cost has gone down, like as we were talking about before, where it was very expensive. Now is Internet access much more uh, financially accessible for the average person living there in in, uh, the community? Yeah, yeah, a lot. It's 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 gone down a lot because Mm -hmm. we're able to, you know, kind of centralize it to to just pay in Hawaiian tell mm-hmm. one one customer one bill mm-hmm. now we, we we have costs mm-hmm. that 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 we have to take up which is to pay that bill yeah so instead of everybody paying individually anywhere from a hundred to two hundred dollars a month now they pay us um, a lesser fee mm-hmm. a lot lesser fee mm-hmm. for us to pay Hawaiian tell and um, because we you know Creating a community network, you have to actually kind of like almost create your own internet company. Mm-hmm. So we are our own, um, what they call ISP, right. internet service provider. Mm-hmm. And so right now we're, we're kind of managing it, um, you know, voluntarily and stuff. But eventually what we want to do is create it to where it, it's a job for actually somebody in the village. So mm-hmm. instead of us paying Hawaiian Tel or instead of us, you know, paying direct tv or at&t individually and and having that money go somewhere else Mm -hmm. you pay our internet company which is inside the village yeah and and it provides a job for somebody that lives there right you know and so it's it's um cost has gone down a lot but Mm -hmm. uh what what we're trying to do too is trying to show uh people that you know when when you eliminate a lot of this 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 overhead of, of trying to create profit and mm-hmm. trying to trying to do all these things when you get down to it trying to provide internet service equitable internet service at, at cheap rates it can be done yeah and so we're, we're, we're just gonna kind of blaze ahead and show how that can be done in, in reality for more information on the nation of hawaii visit their website at hawaii-nation.org And to find out more about the Internet Society, you can find them at internetsociety.org. Next up, we're going to the bottom of the ocean. (laughs) Well, kind of. You'll see. But first, a quick break. Transmissions from Hawaii is supported in part by Hawaii Ship. Hawaii SHIP is a federally funded volunteer-based program administered by the Hawaii Department of Health Executive Office on Aging. Their Medicare-certified counselors provide free, unbiased local counseling to beneficiaries, their loved ones, caregivers, and soon-to-be retirees. They also offer free virtual presentations on Medicare-related topics. 
For more information about requesting these free services or joining their team of volunteers, visit their website at hawaiiship.org. That's hawaiiship.org. You can also find a link in our show notes. Most of us never stop to think about it, but Hawaii is in the middle of the ocean. So how is it that we're able to send and receive data here in Hawaii? Well, that's all thanks to a vast array of undersea cables that are constantly transmitting data across the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. I tracked down an expert on the subject. My name is Nicole Staroselsky, and I am Associate Professor in the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication at New York University. Dr. Starosalski is also the author of The Undersea Network, a book that explores everything from the history to the socio-cultural and environmental impact of these undersea cables. The whole story of how I started my research really began in Hawaii. Like, I was, yeah, I did not know very much about undersea cables. I was tracing them on a map. I was just sort of trying to figure out, like, what are these infrastructures that carry all of the internet across the ocean? And uh-huh. I noticed when I was looking at this, these maps that Hawaii was one of the the central hubs of the Pacific. Yeah. And so I got a research grant, which was really awesome. And, you know, I was able to travel to Hawaii. And I, I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll go to the places where these cable stations are. And the cable mm-hmm. stations are the the infrastructures there, the, the buildings where when undersea cables that carry all the Internet traffic come ashore, they connect to other cables in these cable stations. So I thought I mm-hmm. would I would go to the places where the cables land. And I didn't really know very much at that point. I didn't know anybody who worked in a cable station. I didn't really know anybody in the industry, um, who many of whom I would later meet. But I was just a graduate student. And so I was kind of just wandering around. Um, I eventually got in touch with some of the people who worked at the cable stations, but not when I first visited. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, driving up and down Farrington Highway, I was able to identify where the stations were. And I was trying to get a sense of, well, why were these stations put here? What was the connection or disconnection between the stations and the people who lived in this area? Mm -hmm. And, And so I was, you know, hanging out on a beach, like taking pictures of the cable stations and the beach and trying to sort it out. And I met this guy and I called him John in in the the book and he very generously like offered to show me around and just kind of take me around and tell me you know what the area was like and to kind of just sort of inform me um Mm -hmm. in exchange I was telling him about the undersea cables and telling him about you know that they come up in these manholes and then they connect to these stations and they connect to other cables all across the Pacific and they connect to Tahiti and Japan and California and Oregon and uh, Fiji and New Zealand and Australia and all of these, this, this internet traffic that's connecting all over the world is actually being funneled right beneath our feet. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to explain that to him. um, And he was trying to explain to me, you know, what life was like, you know, along Farrington Highway. And, you know, for a few days, he showed me around. Um, uh-huh. And and so I started to understand a little bit more about, well, what what these cables were caught up in and both like why they had been laid there because of the military presence there, like that was deemed a more sort of secure area, um, you know, is uh, because the sort of military had territorialized the area in advance, um, sort of mm-hmm. cleared the way for the cable network. But also then why it had actually become such a contentious area to land and actually was becoming quite difficult for the cable system to extend to Mm -hmm. and through Farrington Highway because of all the the kind of problems that had been caused uh, Mm. by the very things that had made it possible for the cables to be landed there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's multiple landing sites along the highway. Is that is that the case? Yes, that is true. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there there are multiple landing sites, uh three mm-hmm. landing sites along the highway. Mm-hmm. And and they come in, you know, there the the one site was developed um or two of the sites were sort of Cold War era sites. 
Mm -hmm. And the stations are kind of Cold War era stations. And one of them was uh, built for the Compact Cable, which was a Commonwealth Pacific Cable. And that was basically to connect Canada, Australia, uh, Fiji. And Hawaii was one, one stop on that Commonwealth Cable. And mm -hmm. then the United States connected to Hawaii and then went uh, west from there um, on the Trans-Pacific Cable Network. And mm -hmm. so it's actually a really unique set of network landings because you've got this sort of uh, almost like north-south cable system that's mm -hmm. built on the back of the British system, the British mm -hmm. telegraph system. And then you've got this east-west cable system, you know, from the United States to, to East Asia that's mm -hmm. built on the back of their colonial cable system. And both of these cables landed in the Cold War era along Farrington Highway. And today, mm. internet traffic still traverses these same paths. Hmm. Wow. In in the book, you mentioned it, and you kind of mentioned it just right now. But uh, there, there's sometimes here in Hawaii and, and in some other places, there has been resistance towards uh, the, I guess, the construction or the uh, implementation of, of these cables and stations. Um, what was the case, for example, there at Farrington, in the Farrington Highway area, West Oahu? What, what was it that the locals were resistant about? Well, I think that there, is, there tends to be resistance to cable systems when the people who are running the cable systems or installing the cable systems aren't necessarily in touch with um, or connecting to the local communities. Um, mm -hmm. Because then it just kind of can look like another, you know, major infrastructure. And, and people might wonder, is like this an oil pipeline or what's basically right. being laid, right? You, you mm -hmm. don't know, right? It, yeah. it just looks like you know, is this a warehouse? Is this a military installation? Not many people know about undersea cables. And even if you talk about undersea cables, it's kind of baffling, right? Yeah. Like you're like, oh, all the internet, it travels on the bottom of the ocean floor yeah, through yeah, yeah. these cables that are like the size of a garden hose, all of it, yeah, like, all the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but what about satellites? I mean, I think that's yeah. the natural like, answer satellites, to that. Satellites, less, less than 1%. The internet does not yeah. travel through satellites for most uh -huh. of the world. So, yeah. so I think that when cable systems are being set up, if there's not enough knowledge about what the systems are, it's very easy to sort of misperceive them as something that's going to be a lot more sort of either ecologically detrimental, socially mm -hmm. detrimental, or harmful or threatening, mm -hmm. if you don't know. And then on top of that, you know, none of this traffic was being funneled off into the hands um, or networks or cell phones of people who were you know, living along Farrington Highway, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, eventually it does, right? So like, uh, you do get a little bit of trickle down where it's like, okay, there are these huge cable systems and they're traveling uh, across the Pacific and they're bringing with it all of, you know, uh, people in Los Angeles talking to people in Tokyo, right? Or traveling mm -hmm. under these beaches. But it's not so simple to say like uh, someone who lives on or next to that beach that they could just tap into that. It's like a major freeway right. and living mm -hmm. like underneath a major freeway without an on-ramp or a car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. how, how then do you even feel like you're connected to this infrastructure? You don't necessarily, if it's run through your community, you don't necessarily think, well, this is benefiting me yeah. or this is something I should identify with or care about. So there can be a lot of resistance in those instances. I think the case, yeah. there's a case in Tahiti mm -hmm. where there was a celebration of the cable system landing and there was mm -hmm. a monument put up right in a school. And mm -hmm. I think that um, also came along with a lot of publicity about the cable and the people who laid the cable, you know, came up with a, you know, a logo and a graphic and told a story about the cable system connecting mm -hmm. not to an ancient sort of, uh, you know, colonial network, but rather to um, the movement of islanders across and between different islands and the ways that the ocean, you know, permitted that movement and today the ocean permits the movement of the internet. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. there was a different kind of narrative that was spread about the cable. The mm -hmm. cable was not laid uh, 
along a path of an old telegraph network and it was not laid in the same kind of configuration, say, uh, in Farrington Highway, where uh, the cable stations are laid up up in the mountains that have been territorialized, uh, you know, by the by the United States. In Tahiti, the story was a little bit different. So people thought, saw the cable as like a connection that was going to enable, you know, uh, uh, internet connection to the world. They saw it, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. or this was the kind of narrative that was spread. And right. so it's easy to sort of cast that system and portray that system as a point of, of pride. Mm-hmm. And to have people who could then identify that system as a... Uh, an important connection for them, whether or not they actually ended up using it, um, sort of be, besides the point, they saw it as something that could benefit them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in the book, you describe several, you know, landing spots, cable stations, um, like across the Pacific, not just on Hawaii, but for example, in Hawaii, you, you touch on, you know, the Farrington Highway area, but you also describe a couple other ones. Could you give us an idea of just kind of how these places differ? Like, you know, there, are they just like little shacks in the middle of nowhere or are they more like complex kind of buildings? Like what kind of places are these where the cables are coming on land? Well, some of them, so the Cold War era cable stations, Mm -hmm. and this would include, for example, there's a cable that comes in at Hanama Bay. um, Mm -hmm. And that station is buried underground. And Mm -hmm. it was sort Mm -hmm. of part of, uh, like many stations, and there's another one on Farrington Highway, that's that's underground and it's built in this kind of bunker-like mentality, right? Mm -hmm. There's really thick walls and... Um, it's kind of disguised, it's hidden. Um, mm-hmm. And so these cable stations have been in use for a long time. And actually mm-hmm. the Hanama Bay cable station, um, the the in order to get through um, the cable laid through Hanama Bay, they mm-hmm. had to blast uh, through the reef. And that's, wow. that's now called the telephone cable channel. Um, and it's actually, oh. if you go out Hanama Bay, you'll see there's this kind of channel through the center. And that oh, was okay. actually produced through this dynamite <laughs> blast. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, oh. so if anybody is you know out, out swimming there or snorkeling there, you will be able mm-hmm. to see that that, uh, that channel was actually created. And I have pictures mm-hmm. of it, of the mm-hmm. blast that they created in order to get through the reef, to get the cable out through the reef. Right. Um, there is another cable station on Farrington Highway that is... Uh, the one that I mentioned for the Commonwealth Pacific Cable. And this actually has like a, a really interesting story uh, to it. It's the, mm-hmm. um, it was built uh, like in the 1960s, I believe. Um, it's, I think it was 1962. And yeah. the, the cable st- station was uh, built as this sort of like kind of classic uh, Cold War era station. But what mm-hmm. happened is they ended up developing uh, a kind of new uh, kind of uh, design for the cable station mm-hmm. um, in the mm-hmm. 1980s. And it was actually designed by a local Honolulu-based firm. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it was inspired by, like, basically the CEO of Teleglobe Canada visited the station. And there was very little space. It was not a very, like, staff-friendly environment. There's not much space for gathering inside. And so, basically, most of the staff members at the station had to, like, hold their meeting in this small, cramped lunchroom. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, the CEO saw that the station workers were, like, outside, joking around, and kind of, like, hanging out. And he was sort of inspired by this community. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they built this new staff friendly environment and it was sort of read the redesigned station is beautiful i mean they have you know it's got this this view um and it's got a mm-hmm. lot of uh, it's got this kind of uh, glass facade um and so there's uh it's a different kind of mentality of station mm-hmm. construction it was meant for like when you walk up to it like it's it's welcoming right it's not a bunker and mm-hmm. so that's just a kind of, you know, there are min- minor differences between these different kinds of stations that reflect their histories, that reflect the culture of the community inside the station. And sometimes, as in the case of, of this one, um, actually, you know, connect to, to the Hawaiian environment and connect to local uh, architecture firms. Mm-hmm. 
Generally, though, the the approach seems to be like to stay out of sight, to not stick out, to basically not let people know that this is uh, a potentially very important sort of infrastructural location, right? Absolutely. You would not mm-hmm. want anyone to know where your cable stations are. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the general mentality is security through obscurity. Mm-hmm. So you don't want anybody trying to interfere with your digital networks. And I think this is true uh, pretty much mm-hmm. across, you know, Internet infrastructure. It's not mm-hmm. usually something that, you know, is is broadcast or marked or highlighted in the same way that, you know, some infrastructures like bridges are super visible. And when mm-hmm. they're constructed, they're supposed to be visible and cable stations, not so much. So mm-hmm. and part mm-hmm. of that is security. Um, and part of that is that, you know, there haven't they haven't historically been, you know, a site of like, you know, celebration, um, Mm -hmm. at least not since their, their origins. Um, the early telegraph stations were often supposed to be very visible (laughs) Mm -hmm. and they were, you know, people knew where they were and they had the name on them. Um, and so, you know, it, that that was you know when these cables were new um and when right. they were the you know infrastructure for global communications it was telegraph cables undersea telegraph mm-hmm. cables well then you get radio and then you get you know a couple of world wars and you get the cold war and really these infrastructures become much more a uh, site of security um and something that you you don't necessarily want to publicize mm-hmm. yeah let's say you were to talk to the average person who does not, you know, think about these things. Is there anything that you would like them to understand? Do you Have you seen any kind of popular misconception or something that people are just unaware of in, in regards to these cables? Is there anything that, for example, the listeners here in Hawaii that you would uh, think that they might, you know, it might be good for them to just know or understand? Well, I think that the most important thing to know about undersea cables aside from Mm -hmm. the fact that they carry almost all of the internet across the oceans and that it does not Mm -hmm. go by satellite, is that Mm -hmm. that's also the future. Almost always Mm -hmm. I will give a talk about undersea cables or talk on a a podcast about undersea cables. And then the end Mm -hmm. of the podcast, someone asks, well, isn't it all going to satellites soon? Or Mm -hmm. won't, uh, won't this be replaced by satellites? The answer is no. Even though there are um, new satellite networks being launched, those aren't going to replace undersea cables. Undersea cables are going to be around for a long time. And and this is for several reasons. If you think about just sort of uh, kind of basic, uh, without getting into the technical details, Mm -hmm. if you have a cable system that traverses the Earth surface, that's less distance, right? So Mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. less distance than going all the way up into the atmosphere, into space, and then back down again. There's no interference, right? You are sending Mm -hmm. signals down a strand of glass at the speed of light. So it's Mm -hmm. direct. Um, And these cables, they go down under the ocean, and they last for decades, and they work for decades. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of them actually hit a point of economic obsolescence before they actually stop functioning. And so Mm -hmm. the... Mm-hmm. So I think this is just to say, like, our cable system is already in place. It's carrying, a, like, almost all of the transoceanic data, um, and it's mm-hmm. going to continue to to work that way. The second thing mm-hmm. that I would say is uh, a popular misconception about cable networks is that uh, people often think that they're sort of you know, if they float in the ocean or they're strung between mountains. Um, and actually what it's, mm. it happens is that they are actually laid very precisely on the, the very kind of uh, topography of the seafloor. So they go mm. all the way down, like deep into the trenches <laughs> amongst all mm. of those uh, kind of weird sea creatures that live at the bottom of mm. the ocean floor. So amidst, like if you just think about that, all of the internet traffic, actually our conversation right now, I'm, yeah. I am talking <laughs> yeah. to you um, from New York, uh-huh. and our, inter- our like, conversation is being transported that my mm-hmm. voice is going into little signals that are, that yep. are actually on the seafloor right now as I yeah. speak them to you and I hear your voice. And our voices are both actually amongst 
there's creatures on the seafloor and the sediment. Like that's actually where we are right now. So I think that that's hard to grasp. It's it's actually the seafloor, um, and and they're actually really really secure down there because you lay mm-hmm. cables across a continent, and you got people with like backhoes like accidentally digging them up, yeah. and like you know uh, all sorts of problems happen when you lay a cable. I mean, you see this probably just locally all the time. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, you hear about <laughs> you it, hear a about lot. it yeah. all the time. <laughs> but you put something on yeah. the seafloor, and it's pretty safe. I mean, people just can't get to it. And so I think that so that like people think of the ocean as really dangerous, um, but it's not dangerous for undersea cables. It protects them. To learn more about the fascinating world of undersea cables, you can pick up a copy of Dr. Starosowski's book, The Undersea Network. You can find a link in the show notes in your podcast app or at transmissionsfromhawaii.com. We'll be right back after this. Hello, producer Tony Vega here, and I just want to take a quick moment to say thank you to all of our listeners. Uh, Thank you so much for all the positive feedback and reviews that we got from episode one. It was an absolute delight to see that people were enjoying the show. Uh, We hope you're enjoying this episode, and of course, we are working on more, so make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss them when they come out. We are doing our absolute best to get you one episode every month, but these episodes do take quite a bit of time to produce, so uh, sometimes it may be a little bit longer longer than that. But if you subscribe, then you won't miss any episodes when they come out. Again, thank you so, so much for all your support and for subscribing to the show. And uh, with that, let's get back into the show. If you were paying attention earlier in the show, then you may remember the name Bert Lum. Well, in um, the very beginning was uh, Bert Lum. He played an instrumental role in helping the nation of Hawaii get internet access at Pu Honuo Waimanalo. I'll just say my name is Bert Lum, and I'm the uh, the strategy officer for broadband in the state of Hawaii. My uh, my office is in the uh, Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. However, a lot has happened since the end of 2019, and Bert has been very busy with other projects, including one called the Broadband Hui. Uh, when when COVID nineteen really hit Hawaii mm-hmm. hard and and everybody was um, pretty much uh, uh, um, because of the uh, executive orders, you know, to mm-hmm. to stay at home. Mm-hmm. So everybody was working as well as as educating from home. And and uh, what what became very very obvious was that there were a lot of people that weren't connected. Mm. And that became that became kind of a rally and cry. So over the course of uh, since March, uh, we've been convening something called the Broadband Hui, and the Broadband Hui is community stakeholders that want to help in in various ways to help close that digital divide. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so we were able to bring together. We started off with maybe you know twenty twenty people, which mm-hmm. consisted of the carriers, you know, like the the Hawaiian telecoms and the uh, spectrums mm-hmm. uh, and it grew to now, which is uh, we have a mailing list of, of more than 200 people that represent uh, a, a combination of um, private sector, which, you know, includes the carriers, the wireline carriers, the mm-hmm. wireless carriers, uh, nonprofits, uh, various uh, industry uh, experts in, in areas um, like um, telehealth, uh, we've we've got the uh, the Department of Education, you know, mm-hmm. the University of Hawaii, private schools involved, and so so the the Hui has been an ongoing uh, discussion about how do we help to address you know the disparity that mm-hmm. that really was brought to the attention of everybody as a mm-hmm. result of the pandemic. Mm. So um, s- since starting that, have you seen, um, you know, like some changes or what what is going on to help people uh, get access to the Internet? Has there been any sort of, you know, specific thing that you can point to? Yeah. So <clears throat> so what has happened is that we bring people together and and the the big thing about bringing people together is that they bring a variety of different resources with them. Uh, so 
one of the things that that um and it's not like you know i do all the work it's sure it's, it's a it's a collective effort and a collaborative mm-hmm. effort so i'll give you an example so the you know the department of education was able to get some monies to deploy laptops as mm-hmm. well as mobile hotspots so that was a a big effort to get students connected uh, there's another group, a nonprofit called Hawaiian Hope, mm-hmm. and they were very much involved with uh, refurbishing of hardware. Oh, so wow. this is a way of getting uh, families uh, and students, as well as uh, Kupuna, mm-hmm. who perhaps didn't have a computer, to get a computer for free because mm-hmm. these were these were donations that were uh, made to Hawaiian Hope. And they were from legitimate, very legitimate businesses like banks mm-hmm. uh, that would give them the hardware and they would then, you know, refurbish it and then get it out to, um, you know, needy families. And, and so there were, there was, there is still, you know, a going on, uh, an ongoing effort to deploy, uh, you know, hardware solutions. Another one is uh, something called Wi Fi on Wheels. Mm. And so one of the, Nonprofits, uh, the uh, folks over at uh, Hawaii Kids Can, uh, they had seen an opportunity to perhaps use uh, uh, buses that weren't currently being used, and and equip them with uh, Wi-Fi um, access points. Mm-hmm. So that was a partnership between um, Hawaii Kids Can and and uh, the. Uh, wireless companies that that equipped the bus with something that could uh, communicate to the wireless towers Mm. and then from the bus they could deliver wi-fi to students that uh could could uh you know congregate around you know this Mm. uh this wi-fi on wheels bus Mm, so that's another another example yeah Mm. a fourth example would Mm. be like we were able to get some cares money Mm-hmm. for a telehealth project mm-hmm. and the the telehealth project was um <clears throat> with a nonprofit called hope services and mm-hmm. they had already been doing services for uh homeless uh, communities on the big island mm-hmm. but what the telehealth piece enabled them to do was actually take uh, uh ipads and mobile hotspots mm-hmm. so that they could be equipped you know to communicate directly uh, in you know the information that they could um, gather on the mm-hmm. field uh, into their their um, online system. So mm-hmm. so it was it was a way to improve their their um, interaction and data gathering. Mm-hmm. So rather than do it on hard copy, they mm-hmm. could do it they could do it via the iPad. And mm-hmm. then the fifth one uh, that I, I just quickly mentioned is that mm-hmm. uh, you know the the model that we helped to develop up at the uh, Puhonua or Waianae or Waimanalo mm-hmm. uh, is now being extended into other rural communities. Puhonua or Waianae is, is one. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're looking at also doing one in uh, Molokai as well as uh, Kipahulu. Mm-hmm. So those are examples of community networks mm-hmm. that could leverage connectivity, but then also help to distribute that connectivity via uh, wireless uh, solutions using things like uh, Wi-Fi mesh, and, and other technologies. So those are some examples of, you know, projects that kind of came out of us gathering together, you know, in the in the hui. Mm-hmm. No one person could do it by themselves, and yeah. and together with, uh, you know, with other um, uh, stakeholders, you know, we mm-hmm. could bring the right sort of resources to the table. One other aspect of what Bert does involves preparing for the future. It's obvious that the internet isn't going anywhere and demands on bandwidth are only going to keep on growing. So Bert is working on various projects that help ensure Hawaii's connection to the internet remains fast and reliable. For example, since 2017, he's been trying to secure funding in order to construct a carrier-neutral cable landing site. And recently, he's also been working with State Senator Glenn Wakai, who has been talking about turning Hawaii into a prominent place for esports. In case you weren't aware, esports is basically competitive video gaming, and it's a billion-dollar-a-year industry that continues to grow year after year. So, Capitalizing on this could mean new money coming into Hawaii, but again, it all comes down to whether the necessary infrastructure is in place. 
Yeah, so the whole premise behind the cable landing was that it would help to lower the barrier Mm -hmm. for Trans-Pacific Fiber projects Mm -hmm. to consider landing in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And and what's happening now, if you look at the, if you go to websites like uh, Telegeography Mm -hmm. or um, submarine fiber um, maps that show the uh, the entire world and and where the fiber lines run. Mm-hmm. A lot of the Trans Pacific fiber projects are bypassing Hawaii, mm. so that's a major concern because there was a time when they would land in Hawaii for technical reasons, mm-hmm. but because of the technology, uh, there's no no necessity. To, to land in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. It, you can think of it similarly like airlines. Mm-hmm. Uh, airlines are at a, at a point now where from a technology standpoint and from a fueling standpoint, mm-hmm. they can fly right across the entire ocean. Yeah. So, so part of the, 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 the challenge was how do, we, um, how do we identify a project that would help to lower the barrier? And, and, and when I talk about barrier, it's like when, when a private company comes in to consider Hawaii, they would, they would need to spend probably a couple of years going through the permitting process, the land acquisition, the, you know, the surveys, and all the pre-work, uh, not to mention the actual building mm-hmm. of the, what, what I refer to as sort of the undersea conduit mm-hmm. that would get to, get to land. Mm-hmm. And all of that work takes time and money. So if we were to uh, build that, then then it would be much quicker for mm. those projects to actually land here. Mm-hmm. And so that was the that was the premise behind uh, doing the cable landing uh, infrastructure. Mm-hmm. And and what that does what that does for Hawaii is that it it provides uh, more opportunity for Trans Pacific Fiber to consider landing in Hawaii. So mm-hmm. right now we're we're sort of at this hub, right? Um, we have uh, a few cables from um, Asia. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of them are actually going into Guam, and and then from Guam it comes to Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And then we also have uh, fiber from um, Australia and New Zealand, and then it goes from you know Hawaii to the West Coast. And these are all private sector companies. And some of the more recent projects include uh, something called CUS, mm-hmm. and that's S E A Southeast Asia to U S. And another one called Hawaii. So those are a couple of recent projects, and and by building a, a you know an additional cable landing uh, that's that's um, funded by the private sector, what we would have done is instead of doing just one bore, and when I refer to a bore, think of it as a conduit. Mm-hmm. So if a private sector company were coming in to uh, land their cable, they would just build one bore mm-hmm. because that's you know what they're bringing in. Mm-hmm. But if you were to build it so that you could accommodate multiple projects, then mm-hmm. you would do multiple bores. Mm-hmm. And so the project uh, entailed doing multiple bores uh, coming into a landing site. And our initial landing site was in Kakaako. Mm-hmm. So that's what the plan was. That's, the, that's what we've been working on for the last couple, you know, three years. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're still seeking funding. So, you know, it's not, it's not uh, an obvious, you know, um, project that's that's uh funded and and we're moving forward we're still you know working on that part of it but uh to 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 answer your question about Mm -hmm. um senator wakai and and some of the uh ideas and vision that he has about uh establishing hawaii Mm -hmm. as a as an epicenter for you know things like esports in order for any of those types of projects whether it be esports or or even um things like um doing autonomous vehicles or doing uh, AI machine learning or uh, doing any kind of, uh, let's say, um, VR, AR, or even even things like smart city mm-hmm. types of uh, applications, you're going to need a robust broadband network. Mm-hmm. And when I say robust, it's not only on, on island, but you also need to connect the neighbor islands because you know, this this can't be done just for Oahu, right? You wanna mm-hmm. you wanna be able to share uh, this infrastructure and this uh, technology across the entire state, right? Because one of the you know obviously everybody 
uh, listening you know, to to your podcast is gonna is uh, already knows that Hawaii is in the middle of Pacific. Right. Uh, and and if you think about so you know where is it that we get all of this information and applications and 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 games and um, stuff we've learned you know streaming media stuff we've become accustomed to. This mm-hmm. stuff doesn't come from the air. Mm-hmm. You know, it mm-hmm. comes from these fiber optic connections. Yeah. And and if, if Hawaii isn't situated to take advantage or at least show the rest of the world that we have the the capacity mm-hmm. and the infrastructure to be um you know very um not not very we need to be advanced in that arena. We can't be trying to catch up. Uh, mm-hmm. And that that goes to uh, what what Senator Wakai was talking about in terms of of latency. If if we can convince some of the you know the cloud platform folks to locate some of their servers and their applications into Hawaii, mm-hmm. then we can in essence solve the latency problem because all you're really doing is going from you know going from your application device. Uh, to the server. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other, the other thing is as you, as you grow the demand for, for data, mm-hmm. uh, and, and all these applications are gonna, gonna drive that, uh, use of data, you wanna be able to connect to the global network. Mm-hmm. And how do you connect to the global network? It's the trans-Pacific fiber cables. One last question I just thought of, but and I don't know how much you can say directly to this question, but are you, optimistic about the future of Hawaii's internet connectivity, both within the state and to the outside world? How, how are you feeling about things at this moment? I'm feeling pretty optimistic. I mean, I think on a, on a national level, uh, there is uh, um, a <clears throat> not only renewed, but a heightened interest in, in an area called digital equity. Mm-hmm. And, and in terms of digital equity, how do you, how do you get people um, to not only have access but literacy to take advantage of these um, technologies, and I think there's a there's a, a pretty unanimous uh, recognition that that the entire United States needs to be very active, not only as a, a participant but a contributor to the digital economy, mm-hmm. and and more so in Hawaii because mm-hmm. I think there's a recognition that you know if if um, we're going to diversify our economy. Mm-hmm. It's it's going to be in this area of the digital economy, and mm-hmm. I think um, I'm 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 very optimistic that there's there's um, interest across the entire community uh, mm-hmm. from from you know the indiv- individuals that take part in the um, the hui, but mm-hmm. uh, but also uh, participant participants also include you know legislators as well as our congressional uh, team. So there's there's uniform you know support. The question is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you need resources, right? And you need money, mm-hmm. and and um, I know I know from a state standpoint, you know, it's going to be hard to get uh, funds to to fund some of this. But uh, I'm optimistic that we can we could probably get funds from uh, federal programs as mm-hmm. well as uh, the uh, philanthropic community has really stepped it up as well to recognize that some of these projects need some funding and. And, um, you know, they, they have been, um, active, active as participants to, to see where they can help, uh, lend some of their funding resource. If you'd like to hear more from Bert Lum, you're in luck because he hosts his own radio show and podcast. It's called Bite Marks Cafe. That's B-Y-T-E-M-A-R-K-S Cafe. It airs on Hawaii Public Radio, and you can also find it wherever you get your podcasts. Links will be in the show notes, which you can find in your podcast app or at transmissionsfromhawaii.com. Transmissions from Hawaii is a production of Wasabi Magazine. It's produced by me, Tony Vega, in the beautiful city of Honolulu, Hawaii. If you enjoyed the show, then please remember to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Leave a review on your favorite podcast app. And of course, tell a friend or family member so that we can turn this into something sustainable over the long term. We need to grow the audience in order to do that. 
And that's where you come in. So if you enjoy the show and you want more episodes, then please help us spread the word. The song you're listening to right now is called Kaneohe, and this is a version performed by Kuana Torres Kahele for the High Sessions Project. You can find a video of this performance on the High Sessions YouTube channel, link in the show notes. So why are we using this song here? Well, because it was written to commemorate the arrival of electricity in Kaneohe on the windward side of Oahu, and it happens to mention the old telegraph wires. So, of course, as we discussed in this episode, some of the undersea cables that are used today for internet still run over or across uh, the same pathways that were used to run telegraph wires. So I thought it was a nice little thing to include here at the end. Thank you so much to Kuana, Torres, Kahele, and High Sessions for allowing us to use this song. Mahalo for listening, and see you next time on Transmissions from Hawaii. Mekeanu o ko ho o ta hi me ho ba he ya kawe a gele kala pa le o na he na he mekau o ko ho o ta hi me ho ba he ya kawe a gele kala pa le o na he na he mekau o ko ho